Welcome to Crash Course Economics. I'm Adrian Hill. And I'm Jacob Clifford. Some of you might be watching this in school right now, but even if you're not, you probably spent a good chunk of your life getting educated. Nearly all countries require at least some mandatory schooling, and most of those countries provide that education for free. But nothing's ever actually free. There's always an opportunity cost. The money and resources that go into education might be used to fund other social programs or bring down the debt. And if you go to college, the cost is not just tuition and books, it's also the income you could have earned by going straight into the workforce. But is college even worth it? Well, let's look at the economics of education. Why do governments spend billions funding universal public education? Why not just let profit-seeking businesses handle it? Many argue that if education was entirely privatized, it's likely that some children would be excluded, and that would make society as a whole worse off. Education is a positive externality. Education benefits individuals by helping them get a job and earn more income, but it also benefits society, as these individuals create art, invent cool stuff, cure diseases, and make interesting conversation at parties. More education increases productivity, GDP, and standards of living. So today, we're going to look at the education system in the United States. We're talking about the U.S. not only because we make crash course in the U.S., but because education in this country is going through a lot of changes. This way, we get to talk about things like education standards, vouchers, and student debt. Now, to be sure, there are places that do things differently. For example, in the European Union, college costs a lot less than it does in the U.S., or is even free. In America, the government pays for primary and secondary public education and heavily subsidizes college. In 2015, the federal and state governments will spend about $634 billion on primary and secondary education. That's an average of about $12,500 per student each year which is a lot of money. And despite all that spending, the U.S. has some serious problems with its education system. One of the biggest is inequality. Students from low-income families tend to have lower math and reading test scores than those from higher-income families. African-American, Latino, and Native American students are much more likely to drop out of high school than their white or Asian counterparts. For some economists, the best way to level the playing field is to focus on funding. They argue that the government should pay for early education programs and provide extra money for disadvantaged and low-income students. For others, the answer isn't just about more funding, it's about having more competition. Some economists support charter schools and voucher programs that allow parents to pick schools or open enrollment among or within school districts. Now, in theory, this forces all schools to improve or face losing their funding. Other economists focus on the teachers and argue that they should be incentivized to improve student performance. Each of these ideas have been implemented in the U.S. with varying success. We have yet to find the magic formula, but it's clear that the first step towards promoting equality is to invest in primary and secondary education. Now, what about higher education? Is that a good investment? Well, keep in mind that there are many reasons, not all of them economic, to go to college and to be educated in general. People go to college because they enjoy learning and want to know more, or maybe they want to put off getting a real job. But in economics, we focus on financial benefits, so is college worth it? The fact is college graduates, on average, earn more. Economists call this the college wage premium. Among 25 to 32 year olds, college grads earn an average of $45,000 versus only $28,000 for those who only have a high school diploma. Also, the unemployment rate for college grads is pretty much always lower. Right now, for people over 25 with a college degree, unemployment is around 3%. Now, that's versus 5.4% for those who only have a high school diploma. And it's 8.6% for those who didn't finish high school. So bam, college pays off, case closed. Well, not quite. The people who graduate from college are not a randomly selected group. First, it takes a modicum of intelligence and dedication to even get into college. Second, you have to receive a fairly good primary and secondary education to be able to keep up with college work. Third, the students who attend college are more likely to come from well-off families with educated parents who have the time and energy to help encourage their success. So when you compare college grads to those with less education, you're often comparing people from advantage backgrounds to people without many of those advantages. The fact that college graduates make more money isn't just about college, it's also about life circumstances. Let's go to the thought bubble. Economists point out two main explanations for why college graduates earn more. The first is the human capital theory, the idea that going to college actually teaches you skills that'll help you get a higher income job. The second theory is called signaling. This is the idea that students have shown they're smart and hardworking, but in a job interview, everyone's gonna claim, sure, I'm smart and hardworking. 
even applicants who aren't. So the talented applicants need something else to validate their abilities that can't be faked by others. A college degree sends a clear signal. Look at me, I graduated summa cum laude and I got a notarized transcript to prove it. Many employers would prefer an applicant who has an actual Harvard degree over one that has the equivalent self-taught education. But a college degree isn't only about signaling ability. We can accomplish that through a test that would take one day and $100 rather than four years and potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. College degrees send other signals about socioeconomic status and background. Both the human capital theory and the signaling theory are compatible with data. Both predict that college graduates would earn more money, which is what we see. But economists have tried to figure out which theory is correct. They've compared the earnings of people who have earned seven and a half semesters worth of college credits but didn't graduate to people who finished and got a degree. Both groups received about the same amount of education, so if the human capital theory is correct, they should earn about the same amount of money. If the signaling theory is correct, then those with a degree should earn noticeably more. And they do, but it's a smaller gap than you would find with just comparing high school and college grads. It seems that both theories apply. Thanks, Thought Bubble. Okay, so we know that there are significant financial benefits to completing college, but what about the costs? Going to college can be really expensive, often more than most families can afford. In the U.S., students have over $1 trillion of debt. That's more than Americans owe on their cars or their credit cards. More students are attending college than ever, and more of those students are paying for at least part of their education with loans. In 2012, almost 70% of students took out loans to pay for tuition, and the median amount they borrowed was around $27,000. By comparison, in 1993, the median amount students borrowed was around $12,500, and that's just just the median. So even if some of the hand-wringing over the total amount of student debt is overblown, the average student really is taking on a larger burden. So this is all thanks to higher tuition, right? Well, not exactly. At four-year public universities, the average cost of tuition, room, and board has gone from $10,600 in 1994 to $18,900 in 2014 when you adjust for inflation. The average tuition at comparable private universities has risen from $26,500 to $42,400 during the same period. But that rising tuition number is the sticker price for college. In fact, most students receive very substantial discounts. Students from wealthy families with not so great SAT scores might pay that full sticker price. But once you factor in cost reductions from scholarships, fellowships, grants, and other sources, many students pay substantially less. Once you adjust for discounting, the rise in net tuition has been kind of modest. So why all the debt? Well, for-profit colleges and universities might be contributing to this. Students at these schools tend to take on more debt than students at public schools or private nonprofits. It's also possible that student debt is rising because graduate school enrollment is up, and grad students borrow more than undergrads. Another reason tuitions are increasing is because the actual cost of running a college is higher than a few decades ago. As some schools compete for students and their money, some of them build luxurious dorms, climbing walls, and gourmet dining to attract revenue. Another possibility is that colleges now employ more administrators and pay them a whole bunch of money. So in cold, hard, merciless dollars, does it make sense to spend or borrow a bunch of money on a college degree? Well, it depends a lot on the degree you get, but on average, the answer is yes, as long as you finish. Many of the worst student debt horror stories involve students who racked up large debt but were unable to finish college, and that's surprisingly common. Every year in the U.S., 60% of high school graduates enroll in college, but only a little over half actually graduate within six years. That's right, only half. But what about students that don't have the means or the inclination to go to a four-year university? Are they doomed to live in squalor? Well, no, but again, better money can be found in careers that require specific training and skills, which can be learned through a community college or through an apprenticeship. The average car mechanic earns $40,000 a year, the average plumber earns $50,000, and the average electrician $55,000. And as more young people opt to go to college and as older people in these careers retire, most economists expect these wages to rise. So what's the final conclusion? Is college even worth it? Well, I guess in the end, we have to say it depends. It depends on where you go to school, how much you pay for your degree, and it depends on what degree you get. And of course, on what you want to do with your life. Education isn't just another thing that you buy. It isn't only about individual gain. There's a social aspect too. We want everyone to have access to quality education because having an educated populace benefits all of us. Education can also be a powerful tool when it comes to reducing poverty and addressing income inequality. And we're going to talk about that next time. Thanks for watching.
Thanks for watching Crash Course Economics. It was made with the help of all these nice people. You can help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever by supporting the show at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the show with monthly contributions. Thanks for watching DFTBA.